we don't talk a lot. I feel like we, we should talk more as time goes on about other subjects besides just straight up national politics. In this case, we have um, civil asset forfeiture taking place in um, Missouri. Mm-hmm. And I want to remind everyone, if you're not aware of this already, that if you take all the robberies, burglaries, et cetera, that happened in the U.S. in a single year, uh, they don't equal anywhere near the amount of money that is stolen uh, by police from U.S. citizens, which, of course, is only eclipsed by the amount of money that corporations steal from citizens. So if you're talking, again, stealing from citizens, it's other citizens, police, and then corporations in that order. And this is a case where that happened. So a news report uncovers a shocking civil asset forfeiture practice that allowed Missouri police to seize at least $2.6 million during traffic stops in a single year. As part of a larger series on civil and uh, national asset forfeiture cases going on, the uh, Pulitzer Center and the St. Louis Public Radio reported that St. Charles County law enforcement coerced at least 39 unsuspecting motorists into signing over their assets in just 2018. And we're just learning about this now. According to the report, the officers would lie in wait for a car to committing a minor traffic violation. Upon seeing the minor violation, officers would then pull the car over, question the motorist, and then direct them to a private towing lot owned by Superior Towing. Uh, while in the lot, the officers would ask more questions and search the vehicle. All in the hopes of finding large amounts of cash or connections to drugs. If a trained police dog smelled marijuana on the cash, which again, we've, you can, there's a lot of cases where police officers will falsely trigger that, that it didn't actually happen. They'll just get them to sit on their own. They'll have commands for that. And then they'll be like, well, the dog sat. They could go, oh, wait. Um, the officers, they then gave the motorist two options. Either, hey, we're going to arrest you right now for drug smuggling or whatever because our dog smelled cannabis on this dollar on these dollars or you can just sign away the car to us you can sign away the money to us give us everything and we'll just we'll you'll just give you a, a traffic ticket for that so but you don't have to go to jail um in the tw- 39 documented stops no criminal charges were filed a third of the targets were taken and were stopped and taken to the lot after midnight so this is very early in the morning additionally Nearly half of the drivers had either Hispanic or Asian surnames, so targeting groups of people that have on paper a uh, lower chance of retaliating. And now here's the interesting part about civil forfeiture in Missouri, because it's a state-by-state thing. Technically, state law requires criminal conviction or guilty plea before forfeiture, and the assets are supposed to go towards schools, not law enforcement. So generally speaking, you're supposed to go through a process, you have to arrest the person, you got to convict them of a crime, and then you can steal their money. But they're not doing that. They're not going down a different path. And of course, they're taking advantage of people who don't know that. By turning over their convictionless assets to the federal government, the St. Charles law enforcement can split the funds 80-20. A, lo- a legislative effort to close the loophole and law enforcement and enforcement to comply with state law was defeated this year after the police lobby quietly campaigned against it, calling it anti-police. So here we have police coercing people into giving up possessions to people who have committed absolutely no crime, and then quietly going through legislature with their power and saying, if you vote for this, you're anti-cop. So what do you think, Paul? Yeah, civil asset forfeiture is the kind of thing that has always rubbed me the wrong way. I think the... the the primary thing being that it, the onus is on the person who had their property taken from them to prove that it was not involved in criminal activity. And that is essentially the opposite of the way our legal system works. Like everyone is aware of the phrase innocent until proven guilty. But well, why is it that the police can say, I'm guilty of having this money that was in connection with a drug uh, purchase? And so it's or it ne- just smells of cannabis. It just smells of cannabis, and therefore it, it now belongs to the police department. So now I'm guilty before being proved innocent. I have to prove my innocence when it comes to was that money involved in a drug deal? Like that's I don't know if that's even provable. 
in the first place. And the fact that we have the onus on the person who had their money stolen by an official of the state that's ridiculous. Well, remember, Paul, with civil asset forfeiture, you're not under arrest. Your stuff is under arrest for supposedly committing a crime. So. Well, my stuff should be, you know, innocent until proven guilty. Maybe. I just, I think that seems like a reasonable thing in our justice system. And it's very hard with that once you get into that place because you can't just say, hey, that's my stuff. The police say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're not under arrest. Your stuff is under arrest. And your stuff is isn't connected to you anymore since we have it. So you can't just get a lawyer and try and fight this because it's not you you're defending. It's the stuff that's being attacked. It's it's a convoluted legal loophole way for police to steal stuff from citizens with impunity, which is not a law we should have on the books at all for any reason. Uh, it, it's not preventing criminals from having access to the tools they need to perpetuate criminal activity, it is serving as a punitive measure against citizens within the country. Uh, it's, it, I don't know, it's... And police, again, this is, police literally use this in their budgeting, and usually this other part of this happens is that if $10,000 is found and confiscated, when they go to the station, they're like, well, I found $6,000 here, I'm going to fill out this form that the $6,000 I have. So it's, you know, if you're a corrupt cop, this is a great time to be an American. Uh, again, all the burglaries, all the robberies, if uh, police stopped uh, fighting those and stopped doing civil forfeiture, Americans would have more money than they do now. That's insane. The other thing that, that make, this makes me think of is how much of that civil af asset forfeiture is tied up with drug-related offenses. So as states, I mean, you know, Illinois very recently legalized recreational use of marijuana, and we're quickly... Um, exonerating people from prisons and exp expunging records and things like that. When the climate shifts from, you know, persecuting individuals who engage in recreational drug use for financial gain for a state policing entity, when that becomes less profitable uh, than the amount of tax revenue that's gained by legal recreational marijuana sales uh, or by an other ancillary things. So the other, the other, uh, uh, part of that equation is the amount of money that is spent in government contracts towards uh, the prison industrial complex and the amount of money that they make out of using slave labor from inmates. So that's that's this horrible cost benefit is that to the most interested parties in any given state, it needs to be more profitable to allow the recreational use and sale of, of recreational, recreational, <laughs> recreational cannabis uh, than the amount of money that you could earn by persecuting recreational drug users. Here's something interesting. I remember I did this, I looked this up a while back, so it might not be accurate anymore. It was like a year or two ago that I did this search. Here's a fun one. There are, if I remember correctly, about 10 times as many um, gang members in police databases are estimated by the uh, government as there are police. Also, there are about 10 times as many... Uh, killings from gangs as there are by police, which means mano y mano, person to person, police are killing about the same amount of Americans per person as gang members are under that. That's an interesting thing right there again. So, and I'll get on top of this. This is, this is what do we, we call ourselves free. We call ourselves, uh, and it, it, there's still people that will, the same people that are going to want us to go to war are the same exact people that are going to say civil asset forfeiture needs to be a thing and it needs to stay that way. Hey, if you think you're free, try planting a ca cannabis plant in your front yard. See how long it takes. Yeah. And that's another thing. With, with when Illinois did our recreational, the police unions were livid that that was happening because they're going, hey, when we pull someone over and we want to make up a crime that they're guilty of, all you have to do is go... <laughs> Speaking to your camera microphone, I smell cannabis. Now I'm going to search your entire vehicle. Now what are they going to do? They can't just search everyone's vehicle for illegal substance. 
So it, they make money off of it. They steal money from people more than all robberies combined. Uh, civil ethics set forfeiture means you don't even have to be guilty for it to happen. And they will use their power and lobbying. And it's crazy how like teachers unions, I wish teachers had this kind of union power that they could like just kill a bill by quietly going through legislatures and saying, kill this bill. And, but police, they have no issue doing that. They have no issue saying it's anti-cop. So it must be bad because we said it. The cops say it's bad, so it must be cops. Yeah, bad. if the cops say it's bad and, and you support it, then that means you support criminals. Yeah. Like, it's it's a false equivalency, and, it, and it's stupid. And the thing that gets me is that even the, the origins of policing outfits in the United States, like, so a lot of folks will— you know, look at the police as an entity that is there to protect and to serve and to keep order in society. And the reality is that the the police came out of things like the Pinkertons, right? Mm -hmm. Private, private, strong arm, you know, security Slave groups. patrols? Yeah, that persecuted workers who tried to go on strike or tried to fight for better living wages, right? The, the law enforcement is there to protect the capital owners of our society, right? Law enforcement is not there to protect the citizenry as much as they want to have that be their PR image. Just not the reality.